Well, we've been in our series called Fruitful and Multiply five or six weeks. Uh, I think it was six weeks on Fruitful. And, uh, and today will be the sixth part of the, the, the part of this series on Multiply. And uh, just a quick review. You ready for this? Multipliers. Multipliers. Listen, God told us to be fruitful and multiply. That's what he told Adam and Eve. This is what God has in mind for you, that you are fruitful and that you multiply. Amen. And, and, and that's not childbearing in and of itself. Somebody just said, oh, whoa, hold on now. I don't know if I want that. Yes, you do. You want that. You want to be fruitful. You want to see God's fruit manifesting in your life, and you want that to multiply. Amen. And, uh, and that was his command to Adam and Eve in the garden. And so we talked about fruitful. We talked about multipliers. We've been talking about that for uh, this, again, today is six weeks. We talked about the multiplier of, and my phone just went out. I got to have my phone out just to make sure I get them all right. Here we go. Love giving, thanksgiving, faith, and then last week, week we talked about believe. You know, faith and believe are two different things, and, and if you missed that, uh, I would encourage you to, to watch last week's message. But today, I really feel like we're wrapping this up, and, uh, and we want to talk about the last one. And I'm going to just let the cat out of the bag. Are you ready for this? The last multiplier that we really feel like the Lord's laid on our heart is the multiplier of forgiveness, forgiveness. And, uh, and I want you to think about that. Think about that in the reverse, okay? If multiplier, if forgiveness is a multiplier, then unforgiveness is a divider. You with me? Uh, it's a subtractor and a divider, right? So, so you can think of something from the negative, glass half empty or glass half full. You can think, oh, unforgiveness. But listen, think about forgiveness and what it does. There's a power in forgiveness, and your adversary knows it, and that's why it makes it so hard for us to forgive sometimes. And today you may think, you know, I don't really have anything I can think about that I need to forgive anybody for. Well, just hold on because you will. <laughs> like as life happens, you're going to have plenty of opportunities on the regular to forgive. Amen. So I am so excited this morning to have a, a, a dear friend of mine with us today, Mike Hatfield. He came with his son, Tyler Hatfield, all the way from Dallas, Texas. Mike and I met one another back in uh, in that Kenny Chesney song, 1980-something. It was 1989 we met at Camp Lejeune, and uh, Mike was about two and a half or three years, uh, about two and a half years probably behind me in terms of when, when I got to Camp Lejeune, and then he shows up. I'm actually leaving to go to Okinawa, Japan in my last year, and we just struck a chord, and I, I got it worked out for Mike to take my job as the chaplain's assistant at the, the, the base brig where we worked at. And I'll just say, Mike had this way of, he was born with roller skates on. He just has skated through life, man. I mean, like the best opportunities, the best jobs, Mike's always had it. But his lifelong dream was to go back home after the Marine Corps and, and be a law enforcement officer, and he fulfilled that. He, he retired from the Garland Police Department, which is right outside of Dallas there uh, in that area. And so Mike's been a dear friend. And uh, so the other week, Mike and I were talking, and he shared this incredible testimony and story with me. And I said, Mike, you have got to come to our church, and I want you to share this with us. And, uh, and, and he said, okay, man, I will. And, uh, uh, and, then, and so this may be a thing for him because a couple of weeks later, he's, he, he has a couple of partners and they have a, a, a construction company and they go in and upfit commercial spaces uh, in the southeast part of the U.S. And they're meeting with a client and he's telling about this story. And this guy was a pastor. He said, Mike, you got to come share this at my church. So he's, he's starting to develop this ministry thing, I think, now. Now, Mike was really clear to say to us, too, I'm not preaching. I'm not a preacher. I'm just coming to share my testimony, okay? And so he's going to share his testimony. Mike, you come all the way from Dallas, Texas, and share your testimony today, brother. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. I'm glad that you got that out of the way, that I don't have to t remind you all that I am in the construction business and we're all under construction right now so we're all kind of in the construction business right so uh, awesome to be here uh, I am going to share some things about my my life uh, my story and I want y'all to know right now that I am we all have these individual things that that God has put in us that he's made us a certain way well I'll tell you some of my weaknesses some of my faults and you're going experienced some of those this morning one is if you ever lived in an old house 
and you have bad circuits that pop every time you blow, run the hair dryer, you know, when it, when it heats up, your circuit blows, you got to go out to the garage when it's cold, flip the circuit. Well, one of my circuits is I can, can get highly emotional. So I'm going to apologize in advance. Uh, I'm going to share some things that really are dirty laundry for me. And I'm going to talk about my family. I'm going to talk about some experiences that have been going on in my life since October of last year. And you that are sitting here today have been prayed for from my home group back in Dallas. We have met every other Sunday. We've been praying for this day, for this moment, for me to be here. They know how far out of my comfort zone this can be for me to be standing here talking to y'all. But I'm going to tell you, the hand of God has been on this entire experience. My trip here, being with y'all, meeting some great people, Mike, Jason, Scott. I mean, like, it's been a great weekend uh, to be here and, and meet some people. So um, there's some things about this story that you're going to say, ah. Oh, you're going to talk about not forgiving people. You're going to talk about holding grudges. And the stories you're going to talk about, man, I've been through stuff way more serious than you have. I am not here to discount anything that you've gone through. In fact, I want you, for the next few minutes, to start picturing some of the terrible experiences you've had in your life where it's been really hard for you to extend forgiveness. And I bet that there are some people here today that still are harboring some unforgiveness. There's just too many people in this room that still are holding on to something. And I'm going to encourage you today to do something that I've done up, up recently, and that is to do what the Frozen movie says. Let it go. But we're going to talk about it from a scriptural standpoint, okay? So first of all, um, this sermon, uh, it's not a sermon. This talk <laughs> has been in preparation for over 30 years, and that's because one of my faults as an individual is that I am a grudge holder. My last name is Hatfield. Have y'all heard about the Hatfields and McCoys? Yeah, we had a fight over a pig. We killed each other over pigs. So it's kind of like natural for me to, uh, ha to have this innate, terrible ability to hold a grudge, to not forgive people. And my mom's probably going to watch this later, and I don't want to say that this is my mom's fault, but there are people in my family that I can remember back from nine or ten years old that would talk about, oh, those people did us wrong, like we are not forgiving them. And it, so it, it's come kind of natural, naturally for me to, despite the fact that I know I'm a Christian and that we should forgive people, to just naturally hold a grudge. Man, what a mistake that's been for me. So... I'm highly competitive. As Johnny said, we were Marines. We were in the same unit. It, even when we get to our unit, so in the Marine Corps, you're competitive in boot camp. You can attest to that. Um, you you want to be the best. Uh, so we get to uh, the brig, which is where we're at. And there's probably, what, 250, 300 Marines that are in our unit at the brig. And while I was in the chapel, I had my eye on another job where there was about 17 other Marines they got assigned to a correctional custody program where it's like Marines went through boot camp all over again. And we were in charge of putting them through boot camp because they'd gotten in some trouble. So I wanted to get out there. I wanted to be part of that group. Um, so I'm telling you that because I've got a competitive nature. Is anybody, any parents in here, can you, can you, are you highly competitive? Do you, yeah, okay. There's some people in here. I would not let my kids win at shoots and ladders. I would not, like, we... Highly, highly competitive. Um, in fact, I've got Tyler on the front row with me today. Tyler and I, when we fish together, it's a competition to see who can catch the most fish. While I celebrate all the fish he catches, deep down inside, I'm pretty angry that he caught more than me. And then I've got a daughter, Maddie, who, uh, I want, don't throw the picture up yet, Joel, but just in a second, Maddie um, had to experience just how competitive I was. So when Maddie was about six years old, she asked me one day, she goes, Hey, Dad, can I, go, can I go run with you today? I was like, I run a long way. She goes, yeah, yeah, I, I want to run with you. Like, you want to go run, like, through the neighborhood with me? Yeah. Okay. So I had Jill get in the minivan and follow us with the flashers on, thinking that Maddie would make it a block or two, maybe three, and that she would jump in the van, and that would be it, and I'd continue with my three- or four-mile run. So 
about two and a half miles in, as we're running, Maddie is talking, telling me stories, and I've given one word responses because I'm out of breath. Like, great, that's good. Like, so at the two and a half mile mark, I look back at Jill, I said, just go home, just go home. She's with me. So we entered a 5K together at the Texas Motor Speedway. And I was like, okay, I'm really going to show her what running a 5K is all about. Highly competitive, right? I'll probably leave her, but she can follow the crowd. She'll know where the finish line is. So about two miles in, it's another one of those full-blown conversations on a race. She's talking to me, and uh, she looks up at me with about a mile left, and she said, hey, we got one mile left. We really need to pick it up on this last mile. I'm like... I was about to die. I said, I'll tell you what, Maddie, as much as I could get out as fast as I could, go ahead, and, go ahead and finish the race. I'll catch up with you at the end. She goes, are you sure? I was like, yeah. And she took off like a rocket, like just left me, just boom, gone. So this was the picture of us at the end of the race. There's Maddie. Looks like she hasn't run a 5K. <laughs> Big smile on her face. And there's me, like, that's barely forcing the smile because I'm so tired from trying to catch up with her. Uh, so Maddie ran, actually ran here at East Carolina her freshman year from Dallas, and then she transferred this last, uh, after her freshman year, she transferred, she runs for the University of Texas, graduates in May. Super proud of, my, of her and Tyler, but they've had to suffer from what we're going to talk about, and that is not forgiving people. So my DNA, as I've said, is not forgiving, holding grudges. Um, I've got to tell you all about three stories that have really impacted my life, my experience in unforgiveness. And again, some of you have probably gone through some really bad things in your life, some bad experiences. These are my things. These are my top three will never forgive experiences that I ended up forgiving for. So um, the first one was I was a brand new police officer and I got a written reprimand that was totally unjust. This written reprimand was, when you even read it at face value, you would say, man, that, you don't deserve that. And so it, I, I was so frustrated about that written reprimand that I printed it off and I put it in my uniform pocket every day that I got ready for work. And 14 years later, I was working a football game with another Christian police officer. And uh, he's like, Mike, do you do you still carry that written reprimand in your pocket? I'm like, oh, yeah. Like, I'll never forgive this person for get writing me that written reprimand. And uh, he's like, man, it's pretty sad. I was like, what's sad about that? Like, I'll, I will never forget it. Like, so in a uniform police pocket, I'm sure y'all are the same, that you keep your pen in this pocket. So, I mean, this pocket doesn't get open very often. You keep the stuff in here that you got to keep, that you got to reference, like some, something you got to eventually go to, but you're, in my right pocket is my notepad. Well, so I would keep this written reprimand in my left pocket, near and dear to my heart, so I would never forget it. And we were working this football game, and this senior police officer who's a Christian looks at me, he's like, hey, do you still carry that written reprimand in your pocket? I was like, yeah, I will never forgive him for that. He's like, you know, that's one thing about you, Mike, is you are highly competitive. Like, you hate to lose at golf. We do summer camps for the kids. You don't let them win. Um, you... But today, we're standing here, and you are carrying a written reprimand in your pocket from 14 years ago. Like, you're not, if you were playing a game, you're losing the game right now. You are losing this game. I was like, how am I losing the game? He goes, because the guy that gave that to you has not thought about that another day of his life, but every day you get dressed for work, you put that written reprimand in your pocket. Like, that is pretty sad that you've held on to that that long. He said, what you should do is you should take that written reprimand, and you should go and throw it in the trash. Rip it up and throw it in the trash over there. So, I mean, 14 years of getting dressed and putting that in your uniform pocket, it's easy to say you're going to go throw it in the trash. And so I was like, yeah, I'll think about it. And it's like, he got me on the winning part. Like, I'm losing. I hate to lose. I'm going to go. So I walked over, ripped that up and threw it in the trash, came back over and said, now, do you feel better? I was like, well, yes, I have a laminated copy in my police car, so I'm, I'm good. Uh, I didn't really, but I did feel a relief. But that was the part, that, that, that was where I, I think I really started experiencing a change in like, maybe this forgiveness is, uh, there's a little more to this story than what it's all cracked up to be. Maybe Mike Hatfield 
prob- could extend some forgiveness to people, but it, c- it gets worse before it gets better. Because um, how many, I, 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 won't, I won't ask you to, sh- to raise your hand. I'll just say that um, there's a high likelihood that you have experienced some betrayal from a friend. Somebody has let you down. Somebody that uh, truly cares about you, says they love you, but uh, might show otherwise. I had a guy that was my Sunday school teacher, was a police officer, senior to me, and I was in line to replace him at the police department. And uh, I had a lot of respect for this guy. I'm not going to name him because I, this video will probably be seen later, so I've got to be careful about naming names. But people who know me well will know who this is, um, and it has, it has a great outcome to it. So uh, don't turn me off just yet. So we, I was due to replace him, and he threw me, absolutely threw me under the bus with the chief. And it was unjustified. I don't, uh, as it turns out, his pride and his, uh, I think it's all about pride. He was, he thought it would be better to make me look bad, to make him look better. Has anybody experienced anything like that in their life? Yeah. So that happened on a Friday, the day before we were going to go on vacation. And uh, I was numb. I was so angry. And I started formulating my plan to get even. It was so natural and easy for me to go right back down to the depths of my soul and formulate a hate plan for this guy. And so for the next few days, I decided I'm going to make his life miserable for the year that he's got left at the police department. And so that was on Friday. Uh, Sunday morning, we were, gonna, we were going on vacation that week, so even worse. Now I've got to go spend vacation after experiencing this bad situation uh, with, with my boss and, and my mentor, really, somebody that I looked up to and loved. And uh, sat, sat, Saturday afternoon, we're going on vacation, so Saturday afternoon, Tyler, who's 10 years old, comes in the room and says, hey, hey Dad, are um, we going to go to church on the way to, to vacation down to Galveston, we were going to go on a cruise, and I said, no, you know, we're on vacation, like, we don't go to church on vacation, uh, we, you know, we're going to sleep in and cruise down to Galveston, maybe grab lunch on the way, he's like, yeah, no, we'll have time to go to church on the way out of town tomorrow, and of course, my wife, Jill, is over his shoulder going, I'm going to church tomorrow, when a 10-year-old comes in and says he wants to go to church, you go to church, so we went to church, that Sunday morning, as God, in his infinite wisdom and plan, so it just so happens we sing the first three songs. Courtney, the first three songs were all from Mike Hatfield. I know the songs had been planned for weeks, but it was like, oh, they had to use that song. His grace is an oh, goodness. That's, oh, that, all three. By the time the third song comes around, I'm like, okay, I'm starting to get the message here. Like, I am wrong, okay? I, maybe my hate plan isn't going to work like I thought it would. And then the preacher comes up, Johnny, and, he, and it's, it was like one of those Sunday mornings where he said, okay, I need everybody to leave. Y'all just leave. Mike, can you pull your chair right up here? I got some things I need to talk to you about. And that sermon was all for me. So we get in the car, and we're driving down to Galveston. My wife's driving because I was studying for an exam at the time, so I was using the time to study. And my breaker flipped. And Mr. Emo- Mr. Emotional closes that book, and I have tears in my eyes, and Jill goes, what, you know, what's, what's the problem? And I said, well, you know how I've, I was done wrong. Like, I'm so mad at this guy. Like, I, I, I hate him so much right now. She said, yeah. She goes, well, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, in church, I, I heard something. I heard, heard God tell me if people found a reason to hate Mike Hatfield, they would have a lot of reasons to. They could, they could find something. If I, I wouldn't have many friends if people found something to dislike me for. So there's also this commandment about loving each other that, that I have to follow too. And so I said, rather than spend the rest of my time hating him while he's here, I'm going to forgive him even though he hasn't asked yet. I'm just going to love him. And when I say that to you, I want you to know how unnatural that is for me. Like, that is just, it's, 
it's foreign for me to even say that, but at the time, that's just what I needed to do in my life is forgive this guy. So I did. I came back from vacation. I went in his office, shut the door, and I said, I'm going to need to visit with you for 30 minutes. I don't want you to take a phone call. And the first part of that conversation was, this is where you did me wrong. This is what you said that was not right. There was nothing wrong with that, by the way. There's nothing wrong with confronting somebody and talking to them about something that you might disagree with. But here's, here's, what, here's how this ended. I said, here's what I've decided to do with you, Joe. Here's what I've decided to do. I can spend the rest of my life hating you, but I've decided not to do that. And I told him what happened to me on Sunday morning at church and how... I had every plan established for how I was going to make your life miserable, but I heard this message that I've got to forgive you and I've got to love you. And that's what I decided to do. I decided to, to love Joe. And I want you to remember that I haven't forgotten that situation. Okay? I haven't forgotten what happened. But I overlook that now and I forgive Joe for, and I, I love him. And we've spent some great time together since then. Uh, the last story is going to be a longer story, and we're going to talk about it for a minute. I'm going to come back and visit it at the end. So God has started doing some amazing things in my life around October of last year. Um, Tyler has got a testimony that is for another time because it would take too long to talk about, and Tyler needs to be the one that tells you. But Tyler shouldn't be sitting here right now. If Tyler, if Tyler, under the influence of the demons that were in his life, had won, Tyler would not be here right now. But sometime around the first of last year, Tyler had an encounter with God. And no peel, no counseling. It was the touch from the ultimate healer that changed Tyler's life. And Tyler... If you knew us and you were Facebook friends with me, you would see photos of Tyler in January of last year. And you would see photos of Tyler in March of last year or April of last year. And it would look like a completely different kid. The light in his eyes, the joy in his face, he is a different kid. And I'm so super proud of him and thankful that God visited him early last year and has changed his life. But as a result of Tyler's life change, he, on his own, started going to church. I, I tell you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to air some dirty laundry here. Online church became the norm for me. I didn't turn my back on God, but I, I enjoyed sitting on the couch on Sunday mornings watching online church. When in reality, I needed to be in community. I needed to be in community with some believers. Tyler was going back to church. And my wife started going with him, and Mr. Mike, stubborn Mike, the one that likes to win, was losing at home on the couch on Sunday mornings. Finally, one Sunday morning, I decide I'm going to go to church. So I get dressed, and I walk in the door, and one of the greeters is an enemy of mine from 25 years ago that I haven't forgiven. Craig Griffith, and I got permission from him to tell you this story. Because Craig and his family have been praying for this day for a while now. So Craig, I saw Craig, and there, here comes that hate, that thing that comes so natural to me, that unforgiveness. Craig Griffith, the guy that did me wrong 25 years ago. So I go in and sit down next to Jill. Craig Griffith. She's like, Mike, I, they've been nothing but kind to me. I love them so much. Like, they, they, have been, they have loved on me. They've hugged me every time I walk in. I say, you didn't tell me he was a greeter at Lake Point Church because you knew I wouldn't come in here if I saw him. I said, I almost saw him and walked out. She goes, yeah, um, you're just going to have to give him a chance. And uh, she was right, by the way. So as most times women are, um, she was right about this one. Um, and so two or three weeks goes by I'm visiting I see, I see Craig at church I see him greeting and I intentionally go out of my way to be a jerk not, not, not saying anything negative to him but more of like a 
hey, Steve, hey, Bill, and go sit down. So on a Friday night, um, everybody gone to bed, TV's off, sitting in the living room, and God lays on my heart, you need to look up Craig on Facebook, and you need to send him a message and ask him to forgive you. Like, mm, that doesn't sound like fun. Like, he's my last enemy. Like, I've, I have had, I've forgiven a lot of people. Now he's the last one. I've got to have somebody to hate. So I got, to, so we got up, ready to stand up. He's like, don't you get up until you send Craig Griffith a message. So I sat back, opened up my computer, looked up Craig Griffith, and uh, I sent him a message, and I asked him to forgive me. Um, <clears throat> Craig responded with a, a loving message, kindness. So hang on to that for a minute. More on Craig here in just a minute. The preacher at my church came up with a sermon about three months ago about, about what can quench the Holy Spirit. You know, our desire as Christians obviously is to, to become a Christian, number one. And there are people sitting in here right now, it's like, I've got my ticket to heaven. Like, I am good, I am saved, I'm good to go. Hey, good for you, but there is way more left for you to do besides sit here with the golden ticket, okay? Daily, you should be seeking the Holy Spirit. And the only way the Holy Spirit shows up in your life is when you ask him to be there. And so you've got to make it a daily habit of seeking out the Holy Spirit in your life. You, you really have to do that. I've learned that there are some things, even from my preacher back in Dallas, he has talked about some things that quench the Holy Spirit. You want to know what some of those are? Cynicism. Cynical spirit. Johnny gets up here and shares his heart, shares what's, what God has put on his heart, and in your mind... You might look interested, but deep down inside, you might say, Man, I'm, I'm not buying that one. Yeah, that, that one's not good for me. I can take a lot of things, but not that one. Cynicism, it is a way to quench the Holy Spirit. Uh, opposing bold preaching was for my preacher. Sometimes, Johnny does have to say some things. I think a couple of weeks ago, Johnny poured it out there for you. And that's, that is, that's, that's a God thing. Like, he, if you oppose bold preaching, that can be a problem. Blasphemy. Defiant irreverence, being blasphemous. Fortunately, these kind of things are not my problem. <laughs> I don't, I'm not necessarily that way. Despising prophecy is one that my preacher mentioned. So prophecy is one of those that uh, could be uh, abused. So here's what my preacher encouraged people to do. Is if somebody speaks to you or speaks through you, don't discount it. Test it. Put it to the test. When you feel like, when somebody says, hey, I just feel like God has this word for me to tell you, you don't discount it. You put it to the test. That's, that's, that's what we do. But here's the big one. Here's the one big one that's all in caps on here from my preacher that didn't know Mike Hatfield had this struggle, that Mike was working through this, and that is unforgiveness. And when he hit on forgiveness, I was like, oof, yep, that, that would be me. So I want to talk a little bit because we are in church, and I am, although I'm not preaching, I'm sharing my testimony, I want to show you what God says about forgiveness. So if we can throw just a couple of scriptures up here, Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. 
Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Here's my example of, of what um, not forgiving somebody, holding a grudge looks like. This is my best example. Scott, I know you're really good at doing this. You might have to help me put these on. These are some of my official handcuffs that I use to restrain people, but for the next few minutes, I'm going to wear these because this is what my life looked like. Unforgiveness, holding grudges. Scott, will you come up here for a minute? I just want to show you something. When we choose not to forgive people, let's say I like Scott. How he's one that I do like, okay? Um, and uh, yet I've got other people in my life that I haven't forgiven. This is what it looks like to extend love to Scott, okay? Hey, bring it in for the real thing. That, I, how can I extend love? How can I? I'm restrained. I've got, I'm hanging on to some really bad negative things of unforgiveness with other people. It can affect your relationship with people that you do love. Have a seat. Thank you. These aren't made for comfort, okay? People will complain, you put my handcuffs on too tight, and, you, and they, when you say, these aren't made for comfort, well, these aren't made for Christians. <laughs> Christians should not be restrained by unforgiveness. It's time to let it go, okay? And I, I know it's easy to say, but I, like there's a story in the Bible that I want to share with y'all that means so much to me, and it's meant more to me lately because we, we have an example of how to forgive. We, we have an example of what forgiveness looks like. Mark 14. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You're also with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but Peter denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out in the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she again came to him and said to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. He's one of them. Again, Peter denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He again began to call down curses, and he swore at them. I don't know who this man is that you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus spoke to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Now, let me set the scene for you here. That's the story. Here's what happened. Is Peter's by this fire. And it's been proven that when this conversation was going on, you could actually, you were in eyesight of Jesus when this conversation was going on. Could you imagine the look that Jesus, the loving father, was looking at Peter like, I, told, I knew this was going to happen, but it still hurts. It still hurts that somebody that I, that's witnessed all, a lot of my miracles, that's been with me by my side this whole time, is now sitting there denying that they know me. Like, if Jesus wasn't Jesus, and he was Mike Hatfield, that would be a reason not to forgive somebody. But, he, but Jesus, of course we know what happens. He's crucified, he dies for our sins. Peter, for the next three days, was probably miserable. I'm guessing he was a very, very miserable, miserable person. And he was hoping and praying that all those things that Jesus said he was going to do, that he, that he actually does. Three days later, word comes, hey, the tomb is empty. He ain't here. Peter runs to the tomb. Now, I just pose this question to you. Do you think he was running to the tomb because he's curious is he really there? Is he gone? Do you think Peter was running to the tomb because he could not wait 
to ask Jesus to forgive him for letting him down, for turning his back on him, for denying him. I want to believe that that's exactly why he ran to the tomb. He had some things that he needed to get right with God. He had to, he had to ask forgiveness to Jesus, the one that he had betrayed. Because let's look at, see what happens after this. What, what, what happens after? Well, number one, Jesus forgives him. Peter was used mightily by God. After that, after he denies him, <laughs> turns his back on him, he is used greatly. That's pretty awesome. But Peter had to do something. He had to ask forgiveness for that to happen. So he understood some ways that you can quench the Holy Spirit. Unforgiveness. So Peter rushes to the tomb, asks for forgiveness, Right out of the gate, does anybody know, somebody in here, Johnny, you can't answer, you're a preacher. Um, does anybody know in Peter's first sermon, Peter wasn't a preacher. Peter was a Mike Hatfield. Peter converted in his first message when God told him to go speak to people. How many people were converted? Anybody? Not Tyler either because you heard me prepar preparing. 3,000. 3,000 people were affected by the first sermon right out of the gate after Peter had denied Jesus. What a loving, forgiving God that can use somebody, a broken person, somebody who has some serious flaws of unforgiveness and, and uses him that way. Do you think he can't use you the same way? Like there are some young people in here. I'm so thankful that y'all are here. I'm so thankful that you can probably sit there in confidence and go, I don't have an, a forgiving problem right now. Not enough people have wronged me yet. There are some older people in here that probably have had some experiences with some people that have done them wrong. And today's the day, in my opinion, for you to extend some forgiveness and grace to some people that might not deserve it, but as Christians, it's time to reach out to those people and release yourself from the chains, from what's holding you back, from your quenching, from quenching the Holy Spirit. That's this is what can happen. So, um, back to Craig. How am I doing on time, Johnny? I didn't even look. What time do we get out of here? Noon. Okay. Um, Craig Griffith offered me such love. A model, a model of what a Christian should be. Y'all are probably going to find this hard to believe that from that t Sunday that I walked up to him and gave him a hug after he accepted my forgiveness. We hug each other every Sunday. I'm in small group. I sit next to Craig every other Sunday night at his house. What a great God. What a great restorative God that, that can take an enemy of mine from 25 years and we can love each other like it never happened. But it never would be that way if we didn't, if I didn't choose to take the step to forgive. I've been restrained a long time. The, uh, the other part of this story is really interesting. Since October of last year, we had a great Thanksgiving. It was a Thanksgiving where my family sat around the house, there, was a lot, there were a lot of tears of joy because God is so good. He's been so evident in our life. And since October, like I've had some bad, stressful days. But collectively, they've been the best several months of my life. I have been in touch with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been visiting me on a daily basis. I have missed out on that. Because I didn't, because I, I chose to wear these. Scott, will you please come up here and take these off? I, I, do you do have a key, right? No? Okay, good. Well, I'm glad I brought one. Thank you. I might be wearing this one on the way home. All right. 
Thank you. Yeah. So, in October of last year, Craig forgave me. And I feel like these came off. He was the last person that I really think that I, that I can think of that I was holding a grudge against, that I was an enemy even though he wasn't, I was an enemy of him. He wasn't an enemy of me because he, he didn't know there was a problem. That's the crazy thing about this. He replied back to me on that message, Mike, I had no idea I'd even done that. Like, I'm sorry. I didn't know. And uh, here I was 25 years later. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to live that way, to have hated somebody that long and them not even know that there was a problem. Do y'all see where the problem is here? The problem was me. And I released these handcuffs in October of last year. And two weeks ago, I was in church. Things, the service was about to end. And I started thinking about all the people that have been affected in a positive way since October of last year because I chose to forgive Craig Griffith. 34 people. <laughs> 34 people have been affected because Mike Hatfield decided to let go of a grudge and forgive somebody. And, how, and you're like, how, how, does that, how did you do the math there? Well, I count my immediate family as part of that number. Because if Tyler could get up here, he'd probably tell you that he has seen a major change in my life since October of last year. If Maddie, my daughter, were here, she would tell you, I, I don't know that I've ever seen my dad like this in my lifetime. She's 22. I, I don't know that she's ever seen this and uh, I know exactly where the source is I know where the source of this joy can be found and it's in forgiveness so I I, I encountered a guy did y'all know that there is a doctor at with the University of Wisconsin Madison that specializes he is the doctor of forgiveness like he decided 15 years ago that he is going to study the effect of forgiveness on a person. He, his colleagues told him, if you pursue this, you will probably lose your status at this university. You will probably never be, somebody help me as a professor, you get tenure. You'll probably never see that here. If you pursue, this is something that we just don't want to talk about. Well, thank you, Dr. Robert Enright, for standing your ground and taking a stance and studying what forgiveness looks like. Because not only is he a Christian, but he is in a secular university talking about forgiveness. And here's something that he said in one of his podcasts that captivated me. He said, to understand what forgiveness is, it is important to consider what forgiveness is not. The act of forgiveness does not suggest you have forgotten the injustice. Nor does, it, nor does it imply you condone or excuse the wrongdoer. You are not condoning. That only leads to forgiveness that stems from moral superiority. What's more, you are not seeking justice or compensation. I want to pause on that one for a minute. My favorite movies all have to do with getting even with somebody. That was a pattern of, of mine. Now, somebody who holds grudges and wants to get even... Naturally, Equalizer 1, 2, and 3 are my favorite movies. Count of Monte Cristo, when he gets the gold and he goes back and seeks justice over all of the people that have wronged him. Favorite movie. There's a pattern here. When you forgive someone who has deeply hurt you, you let go of resentment and the urge to seek revenge. No matter how deserving of things the wrongdoer may be, you give the great gifts of acceptance, generosity, and love. Though the wrongdoer does not deserve these gifts, you don't let that stand in your way. You give, not out of pity, out of grim obligation. Rather, you give because you have chosen to have a merciful heart. A heart with the power to free yourself so you can live a better life. Forgiveness is a paradox, something that, we may, that may sound illogical but still works. It is the foregoing of resentment and revenge when the wrongdoer's actions indicate that he or she does not deserve them. As we give the gift of forgiveness, we ourselves are healed. I'm going to end with this. I, 
at a time in my life where I was a very angry, holding a grudge person, I went to a home-going service of a lady who had 17 children. And in that home-going service, it was at a Church of Christ. And we were all in our seats. And the family started coming in the back door. And they were singing a cappella music. And even to think about that experience gives me chill bumps because the power of the music was overwhelming. But here there's a back, there was a story to this day that those 17 brothers and sisters had been fighting with each other for years. And the mother's request for her funeral was that this oldest son get up and pray for the, ser- for the service and for uh, the time when it ends. And through no prompting, the brother, the oldest brother got up there and he told a story that I'd never forgot. And I should have paid more attention because it really would have probably helped me with some of my bitterness and anger and resentment and holding grudges and unforgiveness. But uh, he said, he got up there and he said, you know, we have been fighting with each other for years. And he looked at his family members, his 16 brothers and sisters, whew, and he looked at them and said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because now why am I saying I'm sorry is because I need to offer forgiveness. Today's the day. He said, I don't want to be like this eagle that I heard about. I was like, an eagle? Tell me more. Animals. He goes, yeah. He goes, there was an eagle. Eagles are a powerful creature. Their wingspan is insane. They're super strong. They got this strong grip. And there was this eagle that swooped down to get this fish. And he's starting to lift off. And the fish is too big. The fish is too heavy. But the eagle is a powerful creature. Like the, a powerful, he's got strong. The eagle didn't let go. <laughs> and the eagle drowns because he was holding on to the fish. So the fish caused the death of the stronger, powerful eagle because the fish was in his element. But the eagle, the the moral of this story for this guy is the reason I'm asking you for forgiveness is because I got to let it go. It's time to let it go. I don't want my death to, and I say death, we know what what death means, not true death, but just the death of life, the the ability not to live, not to live free in, in, in forgiveness. It's time to let it go. And so he chose to do that. And it was a beautiful service. And it was a story that I remind myself of about not holding on to things. Today, for a few of you, you've been like me. You've continued to hang on to anger, unforgiveness, resentment, looking for justice. Um, My question to you is, who is it that you need to forgive? Who is it that you need to seek out because of pride you know you needed to ask but never did? You've thought of every reason in the world, valid or not, to refuse to seek them out. My request, my hope for you, is that you don't wait three days. Peter had to wait three days. Don't wait three days. Seek the people out that you need to talk to, that you need to ask forgiveness. Trade these things in for some freedom. If, if what your experience will be is anything like mine, you're going you're gonna to realize the Holy Spirit has been waiting to fill you with His love and grace and ability to serve and love others because you've let something go. So that's my hope and desire for you. I've, I've aired my dirty laundry. I've told you what I've gone through. I've told you what my life has ended up like. And so I hope that um, maybe something that, I, that I've said will minister to you, will speak to you. Um, there is a way to get in touch with me in Texas, Dallas, Texas. If I would love to hear your story. I would love to, to know that when I leave here, 
that somebody made a change, that somebody maybe went to sought somebody out that, that they know they need to be talking to, that they know they need to uh, seek some forgiveness from. And so please reach out to me. I'd love to hear that. Um, I want to I really tossed about doing this, but I just feel like the, the, the stage has been set, Courtney, with the music that was done and the, what we've heard today. And this is going to be a bold move. And uh, normally, the way I grew up, this was an every head bowed, every eyes closed moment, but this is not one of those. Because I feel like that if you can't be bold right now, then you probably won't be bold when you leave here to go follow through with this, but is there anybody in here that would join me up here and say, I'm the one you came for. <laughs> I'm the one that, that has harbored the effort. I'm not going to make you tell your story. I want to pray for you, and I think this church wants to pray for you. Is there anybody in here that wants to come up here and join me and say, I've got a person. I've got a person I need to forgive. Anybody? Yep. I knew it. I knew it. I'm going to come down there. I'm going to come down here. Johnny, we come up there and help me for a minute. I. This is not the part I'm an expert at, and I'm glad. I just want you to know that you're going to see something change in your life. I really, I, you are. This is, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to pray for you. This church is going to pray for you right now. There's some people in here that feel the same way you do. They just didn't come up here. I know it. So, what's your name? Lisa. Lisa. Can we pray for Lisa? Yeah. Can we pray for Faith? Faith, it's good to see you again, by the way. Lord, today is not in vain. Today is not a wasted time together. You've loved us. You've been a great example of forgiveness. You've offered forgiveness, and we have done some really terrible things in our life. And Lord, I pray that this week or today or whenever that time comes that Lisa and Faith and anybody else that has not come up here that they will take a step toward forgiveness and experience the freedom and joy of what it means to forgive others and to let some things go Lord we thank you for your example and we thank you that you love us so much and we pray now that as we move forward that this will be a game changer for some people in here that they'll say, what happened to Lisa? She is different. Like, look at the joy of Jesus on her face, man. She is filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray for those moments for faith. We pray for that faith, God, you use faith in a way that, that, that can't even be explained. Like, what happened to faith? That's the kind of moments we're seeking out, Lord, because that's appealing, Lord. People are drawn to that. People are drawn to your Holy Spirit. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Amen. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. What an incredible story, Mike. You Thank you for being real and transparent. I was wondering if he was going to tell our story. He never got to it. So if, if you don't mind, uh, Mike and I had a five and a half year pause in our friendship. So we met back in 89. And, uh, you know, we, we, he's in Texas. I live here. So we don't get to talk a lot, right? But on occasion, we'd stayed in touch, right? But uh, some of you know, I'd go, I went through a, a, a separation and a divorce in 2014. And it was a tough time in my life. And. Mike was one of those friends that was, was closer than a brother during that season in my life. And I remember uh, I was on my way uh, to Lynchburg to visit Jen. Jen and I had met. And I'm telling Mike about Jen. 
and I'm just so excited. I'm, I'm telling Mike about Jen and how I met this gal, and Mike, I really believe this is the person that God has for me, and I've heard prophetic words about this person that when I met them, I would know it, and, 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 and I mean, he could tell, and he was sharing as a friend in my joy and my excitement, right? And, uh, and then I told him, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask her to marry me. I'm going to give her a ring. We're going to get married. And sure enough, we did. And I called Mike, and I said, Mike, I want you to be in my wedding. We're going to get married in Lynchburg, Virginia. I want you to get, I want you to, you and your family to come, and we're going to gather there. That's where Jim was living. I want you to be in my wedding. He said, absolutely, man. And, and, uh, and, and we were excited, right? Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I couldn't get Mike. I couldn't get him on the phone. I couldn't get him in a message. And, and I, I called Jen. She's in Lynchburg. I'm like, Jen, some, something's happened with Mike. I don't know what it is, but I, I, he won't respond to any of my messages. And this went on for a few weeks, and I kept messaging him and reaching out to him. And finally, I'm thinking, like, something has happened here, and I have no idea what it is, but I'm helpless because he's there. I'm here. And so I don't know what else to do. So I just sent him this message. Mike, something's happened. And so I just want to say to you, if I have done something to bring this about, please forgive me. I don't know what it could be, but maybe I'm just dumb to what it is. But whatever it is, Mike, please forgive me. I want us to keep our connection. I value as a friend. Heartfelt, and I never got a response. And this continued for five and a half years. Now, Mike was honest. He was a great grudge holder. So a couple Sundays ago, you heard me talk about the fish bowls, right? And in this journey of the fish bowl, I found myself in Dallas, Texas. I had gone to Dallas, Texas to take Courtney to that school and intentionally didn't reach out to Mike. Mike had always wanted me to come to Dallas, Texas and visit him. And I, I was there before, a year earlier, and I intentionally didn't reach out to Mike. And li listen to me, you ready? This thing about unforgiveness, it's worse than any COVID virus that ever existed. Because here's what happens. Someone's grudge and unforgiveness, if you're not careful, can get on you just like that. And whatever he was dealing with, it got on me. And so I'm in Dallas. When I normally would have reached out to a good friend of mine and seen him and seen where he lived and, and his world, I didn't. And can I be honest with you? And I was hoping he would find out I had been in Dallas and didn't reach out to him. Because he hurt me. And I wanted to hurt him back. I'm being honest with you. A year later, I'm back. And this time I'm back to go visit those stores. And I told you something about that. And I'm about to start my journey on this one particular day. Courtney's left me her car. I'm staying at her place. I'm literally getting out of the shower, just minding my own business. I've got my day planned. And I hear this from the Holy Spirit. Here's what I hear. Reach out to Mike Hatfield. I didn't want to. But I got out, I got dressed, and I sent Mike. I'd sent him a lot of messages before five and a half years ago, and he never responded. But I sent him a message and said, hey, Mike, I'm in Dallas for a few days. I'd love to get together if possible. And he responded back to me. And we ended up having breakfast a couple of days later. And he looks right at me across from the table. He says, I need you to forgive me. I held a grudge. I got something in my head that wasn't real. It wasn't accurate. Perception can be reality. You do know that, right? He said, and I, I just cut you off because of something that I felt. And I said, Mike, I didn't know you felt that, but I'm so sorry. Listen, that was two years ago, almost two years ago. He wouldn't be here today if that hadn't happened. Like God totally restored our relationship and our connection. And I am so absolutely grateful. What I'm talking about this morning, what Mike has talked about, it is really, really real. I have got to form a bond and relationship with Mike's son. When Courtney graduated last spring, we went there, and we stayed at Mike's house. <laughs> we stayed at Mike's house, and it was like this reunion. And we got to make up for five and a half years of lost time. And I got to reconnect with Tyler, and I heard Tyler's story about deliverance. And we formed a bond, and I told Mike, I said, when you come here, you got to bring Tyler with you. I've had, I've had more fun hanging out with Tyler this weekend than I have Mike as much as I love Mike. That would have never happened had he not listened to the Holy Spirit, had I not listened. Listen, the Holy Spirit wants to guide us into all truth. Amen. 
He wants to lead us out of everything that would try to steal, kill, and destroy and bring us into that place of life and abundant life in Jesus. Amen. Can we stand our feet this morning? Yes. Hallelujah. So this is so real. Amen. So listen, if forgiveness is the blocker, you ready? If, if unforgiveness is the divider and the subtractor, are you ready? Forgiveness is a multiplier. Amen. And, 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 and I love this. I just happened to. Don't you like those just happened to things? I just happened to watch an interview the other day of a well-known minister that has written a book about forgiveness. He's been interviewed. And the guy interviewing him, they're talking about, well, how do you actually forgive somebody when it's time to forgive? You recognize this person. You need to forgive. How do you actually do it? And the guy's saying, hey, my dad gave me the greatest advice when it comes to forgiving. He says you, he, you do it the same way you do everything else in the Christian life. It begins in your heart and then comes out of your mouth. He says, you just believe it in your heart. You make the decision in your heart, and then you say it with your mouth. They don't even have to be around. Like, you got to do this before you go to anybody, right? And, and he said, it's just that simple. You just believe it in your heart, and you say it with your mouth in Jesus' name. Amen? Listen, you hold in your hand the ultimate forgiveness. I mean, goodness, think about the word forgiveness. It means for give it means give before like give before forgive like like jesus listen in that while we were yet sinners the bible says christ died for us we were dead in our trespasses and sin we had no way we had no hope but god forgave through jesus through his body and his blood amen listen to this here's the key and we're closing you ready you can't give what you don't have amen and here's what we often need to do. You ready? We often need to receive forgiveness and even forgive ourselves. Are you with me? It starts with that often. And today, as you take the bread and the cup, listen, before you try to forgive anybody, just receive afresh and anew the forgiveness that the Father has extended to you through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's make this confession of our faith together with our hearts and with our mouths in Jesus' name. This is our invitation today to receive what Jesus has done for us. Let's do this today with your mouth. Say this with me. Say, Father, I thank you in Jesus' name that Jesus as your son is my way maker, the picture of forgiveness. Through his body and blood, I have been made right with you. I have been reconciled. And I declare today, Jesus, you are my Lord. Holy Spirit, fill me. Help me to receive this forgiveness and extend it to others when and where it is needed. In Jesus' name, amen. Now receive the bread and the cup this morning by faith. Oh, hallelujah. Listen, if God can fix a serial grudge holder, come on, what can he do for you? Amen. Come on, give him praise this morning. Amen. And I say that with the greatest love. I love this guy really like a brother. Amen. And Mike, thank you for being so transparent and honest today. Listen, your story has set some people free. In here, maybe they didn't even come up, but I, I, I just know in my heart, that it set some people free. Listen, listen, you may have made the decision to forgive someone, but every time the enemy brings that situation or that person into your life, into your mind, you just decide again in your heart and in your mouth, I'm not going to take that. In Jesus' name, I forgive and I've forgiven because I've been forgiven in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give God another praise? Hallelujah. Hey. We're going to dismiss, we're going to dismiss, but listen, if you need more prayer, we're going to have some folks right up here, I'll be here. You need prayer for healing today, deliverance today, anything you need prayer for, we want to pray with you before you leave here today, amen, in Jesus' name. Let's pray and be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for the sweetness of being in your presence. Oh, Holy Spirit, we are so grateful 
from the worship to the word to the fellowship to the bread and the cup. Father, may we leave here truly changed and transformed as we have beheld your image. And we give you praise, Father. Go before us. Go with us. Watch over us. Keep us safe. Bring us back together. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hey, God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you for coming today.